pilot to crew. Stand by for takeoff. Today's mission of the Combat Air Crew's Preservation Radio Hour will profile the experiences of B-24 Liberator pilot Larry Bachman in his own words. So buckle up and hang on. We're number one for takeoff. Chapter 1. A Brief Overview of Military Service. I wound up as a pilot on B-24s. I completed a tour of duty in Europe. Uh, flew out of Wendling, England, halfway between Kings Lynn and Norwich, in East Anglia. Uh, we flew our ship back. We flew three trolley missions at the end of the war, taking ground personnel over the cities to show them what bombing had done. And uh, then we flew our ship back at 17 passengers aboard with luggage. It was one of the heaviest loads we ever took off with. Uh, because everyone was limited to what they could bring, but they all brought a big duffel bag at the end, tossed in and didn't get that secured. So as we took off from the runway, I can recall like it was yesterday, that load shifting back first as we gained more speed and finally released itself and came forward again and we got off, but boy, that was close. Uh, you know, I've been reminiscing about uh, this for some time. I do quite a bit of speaking to church groups, to uh, schools, to uh, service clubs and so forth. And it's, it's just a great thrill sometimes to go back and talk about training command and the whole works. Uh, I enlisted in the uh, service in December of 42, was called up in March of 43. And aviation was really in its infancy at, at that time. Thinking about it today and this year, 100th, 100th anniversary of the first flight of the Wright Brothers plane. But back then, that was below 40 years from the time that they first flew. And the planes that were built up to that time that U.S. government had at least were far from what we see today. Um, we were the 17th largest army in the world. We were behind even that of Portugal when we entered the war in 41, when Japan struck. So um, we had to build really from scratch. We had to design and build aircraft. Luckily, there were people that uh, felt that we were going to be either drawn in or there was going to be a potential market for a fighter aircraft for bombers and so forth. And so they began their preliminary work to build a plane back in 34, 35, and 36. First B-17s rolled off the assembly line in 1936. Uh, 24 didn't come until 1938. But again, ahead of the time we were engaged in the war ourselves. The original B-24s that I flew were built for France. France had ordered the first production run of B-24s, and of course they were captured by Germany, so they were no longer a customer, and they got none of them, thankfully. But uh, Great Britain took all of the ones that were ordered by the French government and began to use them in their RAF uh, uh, squadrons. And uh, eventually, we built up the largest armada of a single aircraft was the B-24. There were uh, just shy of, of 20,000 uh, B-24s built. There were, in fact, over 20,000 if you really count it, but uh, uh, 18,479 were built as bombers, and then all the way up to, to 20,000, several hundred additional ones were built as tankers, as uh, cargo planes, Two of them were designed as personal planes, one for Ch Churchill and one for uh, Eisenhower. They each had a B-24 as their personal aircraft. It was the most widely used aircraft flown by every branch of the service, from Marines to Navy to CBs to Coast Guard. They all flew B-24s. 17s uh, were built in the neighborhood of 12,400 plus. So you can see uh, it was a large number and no other aircraft, fighters or anything, came to close to that except Germany by continuing their 109s and things like that exceeded the number 
over the longer period of war that they were engaged in, from the time that started till they capitulated. But uh, it's interesting to think back then of my entry into it. In my work, in my line of work, I was constantly repairing equipment, trucks, uh, rototillers, you name it. I'd have them strewn all over the garage floor and uh, rebuilding. And uh, so I wanted to enlist to become a mechanic. Went to the uh, uh, enlistment office and said, I want to enlist as a mechanic. You can't do that. You can enlist to be a pilot. If you wash out of the pilot training, you'll wind up a mechanic. So really, when I went in there, my thought was, well, I'll go ahead and try that, but undoubtedly I'll wash out. I'd only flown once before in my life in a Ford Trimotor uh, as a passenger and uh, never been off the ground other than that. So it was quite an experience. Uh, the farther I got into flying, the more I liked it. And uh, of course, uh, forgot all about maintenance and other than how critical it is to have a good ground crew and crew chief that looks after that aircraft and keeps it in flying condition for us. We are very fortunate to uh, wind up with a, with a fine crew. Um, we, we were closer, I would say, than brothers. I, uh, I had a brother who was drafted. He was three years older than I, and that's also something that prompted me to enlist. I did not want to be in the infantry if I could avoid it. He, uh, he was drafted and wound up as a company aid man in the 5th Infantry trained out in California at uh, uh, Marine Base, and uh, uh, although he was in the Army, but they had very rough training. He was killed in Luzon in the Philippines on his 81st continuous day of combat. So um, I recall when I was overseas getting a telegram from my folks that my brother had been killed, and I would have had the right to drop out at that point being the sole survivor of the family. But I told my family at home, my mother and dad, that I came to do a job and I wanted to stay till it was complete. And uh, they didn't argue, they were disappointed, but they didn't argue with me and, and permitted me to stay. Chapter two, basic flight training in Texas. Going back though, from uh, when that enlistment occurred and uh, shipped out, first thing was Southwest Training Command. I wound up at uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, Shepherd Field, the only place on earth where you could walk up to your knees in mud and choke on dust at the same time. That was a typical statement about it, but it was very true. It had winds and sand, and, and uh, truly, when you were out in the area, there's just no question of what uh, you were subject to all the elements of a, of a desert-like spot. We also spent some time at, uh, at uh, San Antonio, Texas, at Kelly Field, and, and uh, we did a lot of the preliminary things that we had to do as pilots there. Altitude chambers, uh, first, first thing you got, of course, was a butch haircut. Everybody got that. It took them about five minutes to get rid of the hair you had on your head, and they just lined up and went through. And, uh, we got shots from both sides from the line. Uh, uh, one guy uh, set his gun down for a second to get another one, and the guy on my other shoulder that was giving the tetanus shot shot me twice. And that's one of the worst things in the world because your, your arm is so stiff you can hardly move it for a week afterward. Uh, but that was, they, they didn't look up at all. They just reached for the gun, gave you a shot, and on you went. I'll never forget my de dental experience, going to the dentist the first time. Uh, I had enlisted, so I went to my own dentist before I left Minneapolis. Said I had enlisted in the Air Force. He said, well, he said, we gotta go through all the fillings in your mouth, because if you have an air pocket in there, it's very painful. So we'll go through them and take them out, put them back in. Well, I wound up with 17 fillings in my mouth. and. Uh, he packed them in and uh, used the vibrator to tamp all the materials in so that there would be no airspace. So when I got in the chair, dental chair at, uh, in, in Texas, I told him, well, I just had all my teeth gone over. Uh, no civilian dentist knows what you need in the Air Force, so 
filled out all 17 of those fillings and started over again. And he did it all in one sitting. My jaws were so tight and sore that I could hardly open them. They keep saying, open wider, open wider. He finished the 17 and he said, well, I see you got four wisdom teeth here. You don't need those, so you pulled those. Four teeth pulled, 17 fillings put in in one sitting. I tell you, it was soup for a while after that. But those are the kinds of things that come back to you and just, uh, they don't haunt me, but they, they sure remind me of the, what we went through. Chapter three, training at Shepherd Field and Washita College. Shepherd Field was basic training and uh, we did a lot of uh, maneuvers, a lot of marching. Uh, it's where we were issued guns and did our first rifle range, and 45 pistol firing range, uh, obstacle course, the works. Uh, a great deal of marching and, uh, and, and some school work there too. Uh, from there we were sent to a college training detachment, the hellhole of the universe, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, Washita College. The Air Force built a beautiful new uh, building for them to be used as their theater and uh, assembly room. That's where all of the cadets stayed. The floor sloped toward the stage. Uh, the building was brand new and sweat like crazy. The, the water just came out of the concrete floor and uh, it never dried out. It was humid the whole time. Water would run down that floor all day long and would puddle in the front by the stage. And they had to pump it out of there because they didn't really even have a drain in there at the time. We'd hang our clothes around the, the bed. The, the beds were all, the, the posts, the bed legs were cut off on one end so that the beds laid flat because it, it sloped, but uh, your head was right next to the, the cold, wet concrete. And uh, then we would hang the clothes on, on the bedsteads as much as we could. In the morning you put them on, they were just bringing wet yet and, and cold, and uh, it was miserable. I recall one fellow from Minnesota that enlisted with me. We stayed together the whole time uh, as, as a group. There were probably 15 or so of us that wound up at that same college training detachment from Minnesota. And I recall this one was a jokester. He just, uh, it just rolled out of him. Joe D had quieted us down, shut the lights out, told us to be quiet, and uh, he came up with one of his long stories, and I won't go into it because it isn't all that polite, but uh, come forth, grabbed the king to Daniel, but Daniel slipped on the lion's skirt and came in fifth, and on and on and on. And of course, everybody broke up and laughed. The OD came in, what's this all about? Who's responsible for it? Well, nobody would tell. No one gave any indication as to who it was. Okay, raincoats and gas masks meet me out in front here in five minutes, so out we went. And uh, he took us out to the track and we did three laps with the gas mask on and the raincoat on, sweating like crazy. Came back and he said, I think we'll be quiet the rest of the night. Guaranteed we were. But those are the kinds of things that stick out in your mind now. They're crazy and funny, but uh, they were all part of it. But we did enjoy the camaraderie of, of groups and it started in my case, a fellow from St. Paul that enlisted the same day I did, he and I were together the entire time in training in primary, basic, and advanced. We had the same instructors. It was unique. Chapter four, primary, basic, and advanced flight training. The primary, primary base was at Box Field in Muskogee, Oklahoma, playing uh, PT-19 a marvelous airplane, thoroughly enjoyable. Um, I had the upper bunk, he had the lower bunk. And, uh, we looked across the room, all the cadets were lined up on one side of the hangar and all the pilot instructors were on the opposite side. And we looked at this guy with a 50 mission crush on his hat and we said, well, wouldn't it be great if we could get him as our instructor? And sure enough, we did, we wound up with him. I will say he was one of the finest pilots I've ever flown with, he was just marvelous. During my time there, we uh, we did a lot of training of uh, 
in the aircraft itself. By the way, at Washington College, we got 10 hours in the Piper Cub. So that was the first plane I actually flew. We soloed it in that and then went to primary training all right, we're and did your souls, solo work all over again uh, there in the PT-19s. And that was a, a big day when you were able to say you soloed. That's the day you lost your tie and a few other things. But uh, great experiences. Uh, from there, our uh, basic training was at Coffeyville, Kansas, BG-13s. And then Altus, Oklahoma was my advanced base. And we had AT-9s, that's a twin engine, all metal aircraft, uh, no longer in production. It was, uh, in fact, we had the last group of those planes and they took the best one apart every day for spare parts to keep the remainder of them flying. We wound up at the very end flying some of the, the uh, butter paddle, the wooden prop uh, uh, planes that would burn seconds if they caught fire. At any rate, uh, then I was called back. We, after our wings were, we got our wings, we were given leave. He came home, was married. I was his best man at the wedding. Uh, he was Catholic, I was Lutheran. We had to get special dispensation from the Catholic Church for me to be there as best man. And uh, uh, the whole time we were comparing notes while we were home, we got, I got an order change that I was to return to Altus, Oklahoma to teach instruments. I kept calling Jim and saying, did you get your orders today? No, well, you'll certainly get them tomorrow. They'll be there. And I guess we're headed back to Altus to teach instrument playing. Well, he didn't get his orders to come back. Chapter 5, Larry and Friend, W. Jackson, Teachers and Tech Officers. There was another man in our class, uh, uh, Dub Jackson, William Jackson, from uh, Wilson, Texas, just outside of Lubbock. Two of us were called back from that advanced class to uh, teach instrument playing. We talked for about three months and they came through the directive that you had to have graduated from Bryan Instrument School to teach instruments. Neither of us had. So they met as TAC officers in the Negro Detachment. That was when the services were segregated. And the blacks, unfortunately, were KP and latrine duty. And uh, we walked in the commanding officer together and said, we really didn't join this man's Air Force to buy mop handles and toilet plungers and want out. He says, you know what that means, you're going overseas. And we allowed us how that's fine, that's what we joined for anyway. And so we were shipped off to Westover Field, Massachusetts. And both of us were assigned as co-pilots in B-24s. I'd never seen a B-24. Got up there and uh, uh, I, I remember thinking it was just one monster of an airplane. And uh, I enjoyed uh, touring through it. it. Wasn't long before we were up for the first time, and uh, I had virtually no training. There was no, uh, most of the others went to a, a, a spot for up to as long as two and a half or three months of transition into 24s and 17s. Neither of us had that experience. Uh, he wound up in a, going to the Pacific, I wound up going to Europe. Then we were assigned to our crews at that point. Uh, the other gentleman, Doug Jackson, uh, was born to be a fighter pilot. Hated the thought of being in this twin engine plane in the first place. And uh, he was assigned to a 24 outfit that was on the same basis as uh, Major Bong from Poplar, Wisconsin. And uh, he flying P-38s. He went into Bong's office one day and he said, how does somebody get to fly a P-38? He said, well, have you ever flown one? He said, no. Well, he said, uh, you start with this, and he handed him a pilot's manual. He read it, went out the hallway and read the thing, went out on the flight line at noon, asked for the crew chief of Major Bong's P-38, and said, I want to take that plane up. Helped him get checked out with a parachute and checked the plane over and strapped him in. And he fired it up and away he went. He flew. He came back into Bond's office and he said, well, I've just flown your P-38. He said, you what? He said, yeah, I just flew your P-38. Well, he said, anybody who wants to fly one of these that bad, 
said, if you can get out of your outfit, said, you're welcome over here any time. They were across the field from each other on the same base. At any rate, he did, he, this guy could talk to Eskimos and sell them refrigerators and make them love buying it. I, you know, he was son of a Baptist preacher and he wound up in a seminary for uh, Baptists and uh, is today a missionary. And uh, he's still, I just got a letter from him yesterday, as a matter of fact, he's still working. He's gonna have another uh, meeting in Taiwan. I'd say he's about number five on Billy Graham in the Baptist church. And he has brought more people to Christianity than you can believe. He met his wife at the seminary, uh, wife to be at the seminary, they married. And their first assignment was Japan. He had been in Japan fighting the Japanese. It was the last place on earth he wanted to go as a missionary, but there he is. Uh, great, great man, just a marvelous person. Chapter six, deployment overseas. Back to, to my situation, uh, Westover Field is a staging area to ship overseas. And I honestly felt sorry for the crews because I had virtually no time. I had less than 15 hours in the B-24 when I was pulled, taken aboard the Queen Mary to be a boarding officer. And uh, we had 14,000 troops that we boarded. And I had to assign them their Philippine area or where they were going to be. Enlisted men were up down in the hold for 24 hours and then on deck for 24 hours. Officers were all assigned to quarters. The quarters that I had were nine of us in a room that was supposed to be for a single uh, steward on, on the ship. We had uh, pipe bunks that let down on chains and then a stanchion in the middle. You crawled in over the end of the beds because there was no way you could stand in there. You dressed and undressed in the hallway. Uh, and, and that was that was the way we went over. It took us seven days to cross. We went over unescorted. And they, I kept, they said, well, no, no sub can catch up to you, but I kept, kept wondering what's gonna happen to the one that's coming across sideways to us, and we really avoid them or not. But we did, and we made a successful crossing and faster than many, many of the troop ships that went over, it took weeks to get over. Uh, so a seven-day crossing was extremely fast. Um, we landed at Glasgow, Scotland. We couldn't pull into any of the docks in England because the draft of the ship was too great for uh, their docks. And we were out in the bay at Glasgow, and then we were taken off by tenders, put aboard trains and onto our base in England. Uh, we landed at night. We arrived at our base at night. The very first night that we were assigned the barracks, uh, the guys that were in that barracks, the officers from four crews were in one Kwanzaa hut. Enlisted men were in a larger barracks, but again, the four crews, enlisted men were all in one, one barracks. Chapter seven, fighting the cold, barracks, stove modification. In the officers' barracks, we were the new kids on the block. And uh, our first assignment was take that bag over there, the gunny sack, and go fill it with coal. There's a compound a little farther down. We go down there at night and we can get the coal and you bring back a bag of that. Well, they, as we were going out the door, now there might be a guard in the area. It'd be just best if you don't bother him at all. Well, we didn't know that it was rationed, of course, and you weren't supposed to be there at all. We came back with this big bag full of coal, and they were just dumbfounded that we had gotten it even. Thought they were gonna get us into trouble, but uh, luckily we got the coal. Um, had a little, just a small stove, about a 12 inch diameter stove, about 18 inches high, in the center of a Quonset hut for 16 men. Wasn't very warm, but, uh, uh, and we were there in the winter time, and it was very cold, and it snowed, and it was quite cold. Uh, we did jerry-rig some had extra support for us. We put a 55-gallon drum of oil up over the doorway. There was an inner door and an outer door. It was always uh, extremely dark around the area, no lights in the base. And 
if there were lights in the bonds that you had to be sure the outer door was shut before you and then the inner door had to be shut before you opened the outer door and so forth for security purposes. At any rate, that was where a 55 gallon drum was. We got tubing and we ran copper tubing over to the stove, down away from the pipe itself, the uh, exhaust pipe from the stove, and dripped oil. We had a way we could pinch it off and just drip a drop of oil on it periodically. It made the coal last all through the night. One big piece of coal would last through the night. That thing would be just blowing red hot. Uh, eventually we got into gas, some uh, waste oil where they had dumped gas from cleaning parts and so forth. So here you had 100 octane gasoline mixed with the oil. When that hit the, the fire, of course, boom, just this big explosion. When that happened, the CO outlawed that. Of course, they were taken out of all the barracks, but it was interesting. Chapter 8, Wimpy Shaw's B-24 crew. I, as I said, was assigned as co-pilot. The pilot that I had, V. Ray Shaw, was a marvelous pilot, wonderful guy. But his nickname was Wimpy. Wimpy, uh, to any of you that saw comics in, in the past, you know, he was a little short guy, almost as wide as he was tall, and loved hamburgers. Well, Wimpy got his name from his stature. He was very short. In fact, he could not reach the rudder pedals to put the brakes on, so we had to put wooden blocks on our rudder pedals on his side of the plane so he could assist with putting brakes on. Um, we were assigned a position to the left of uh, the lead plane or, or our squadron, well, was proof from the left of the lead, and he couldn't see across the cockpit to, to fly formation. So I wound up flying most of those missions. He would take off and land, but I would do the rest of the flying. We did share time, and as a matter of fact, uh, we had almost equal time as first pilot and co-pilot, we interchanged. We also uh, made sure that every one of our people, every gunner, uh, our navigator, uh, and uh, radio operator and so forth, were all given a chance at the wheel. If anything happened to us, we wanted to be sure somebody could continue to fly if necessary. Our nose gunner was the ace of the whole crew. He was our armor and sat in the nose turret and was able to toggle the bombs out from, from there. Uh, I neglected to say that our bombardier was sent back as soon as we got overseas. Our bombardier was taken from us, sent back to the States to be retrained as a, as a navigator. They only used three bombardiers on a flight, a lead, an alternate lead, and a deputy lead. Those three ships up front each carried a bombardier, so if something happened to one, somebody else could take over. The rest of us toggled our bombs out either by radio from when they dropped theirs, or in the case of our, ours, we didn't do that. We watched when the bombs came out, and our nose gunner toggled the bombs out from, from the nose turret. Chapter 9, being designated as a B-24 co-pilot. It would have to have been during your advanced training or transitional training, basically. Uh, you were never uh, given to understand what you were going to meet until you had been up at the transitional site. Uh, I don't know. I, obviously, there was no way they were going to sign me as a pilot because of the few hours I had. When I got overseas, I can tell you that if my CO called me in and said, I see you don't have many hours for 24. I said, that's correct. He said, well, I'm going to ride with you for a few, a few times. We made five flights together. His admonition to me was fly tight formation. He said, the only thing that's going to bring you through this war is to fly tight formation. The tighter the better. And I enjoyed aerobatics. I enjoyed tight flying. I enjoyed the, the reputation of being in where I shouldn't be at times. Chapter 10, Enemy Fighter Attack. They, they, they were targeting the cockpit, by the way. They would come in swooping down and aim for the cockpit, figuring if they could get to the pilot, the whole crew was gone. Um, 
so uh, we had planes come right through the formation. And, uh, uh, actually, the tighter you, you flew, there were more guns concentrated on any plane that came through the formation than if you were out by yourself. On the other hand, they always went for stragglers as well. That was their favorite target. If you're playing a ship that was slightly damaged or wasn't able to keep up with the others, they pounced on them and pummeled them until they were down. That's, that's the name of the game. But again, tight formation. Uh, his admonition to me was, if you don't tuck it in there and keep it in there, you're going to be very vulnerable. He impressed upon me the need for being tight, holding those guns in close to each other where their guns could take over where ours couldn't fire because they need our tail or our wing or whatever. Other guns from other ships could go after them. Chapter 11, here's what I mean by a tight formation. Well, one incident I will tell you about uh, we were returning from a, a bomb run, and uh, I came up under a ship, to, under the tail, and we had an aerial that was about three feet forward of the wind, windshield of our plane on the top of the aircraft that was a radio receiver. And that had about a four foot long uh, antenna. And I put that antenna and tickled the bottom of that guy's tail turret. He climbed out of the tail turret and uh, left his post. Um, the props, of course, were fairly close. Uh, I was very close to him. And uh, he squawked like heck. When he got back, I was reported as being dangerous and there was no way they were going to fly if I was going to do that again. And, and uh, so I was called in to CO. And uh, he said, I'll take care of it. When I got in there, he says, that's good flying, son. Keep it up. That's exactly the same guy that had told me you better fly tight formation. Chapter 12, the pilot with a death wish. There was another time when, when uh, we had an incident occur where we were in our position and there was a squadron that came in below us. And again, one of the had pilots and that plane was from northern Minnesota and he kept crossing under us. It was just, we broke radio silence and told him to get the hell out of there. Our bomb bay doors were open. The, the lead bombardier either toggled them or our, our nose gunner toggled them. We had no control necessarily of when the bombs were going to drop. But he continued to do this. His own crew said, get out of there. We have no position, no need in being in this position. When the bombs went out, they knocked the, the elevator and rudder off one side, completely off the tail gunner. Can you imagine sitting there seeing those bombs come down and you look out, one rudder and the stabilizer is gone on one side, and trailing all the and hydraulics and wires and so forth from that point on. Well, they got back that day from that flight, flew all the way back to base, and we all returned and the fields were, were socked in with fog. We had returned to France, we turned around and back, landed in France. They couldn't do it. They had struggled. The, the, both pilot and co-pilot had really worked hard to even keep the plane in the air. And they stayed pretty close with us in the formation. Fighters picked them up and escorted them. But they kept saying to this guy, well, the field so-and-so is open, and they give him the direction heading. By the time he got there, it was sucked in. This happened three or four times, and finally was told to pull up 4,500 feet and bail his crew. And uh, he himself got out of the seat and held the controls from over the top of the seat while his co pilot got out. The minute he let go of the, the controls, the nose dropped and he got pinned against the ceiling. And it went into a tight spiral, and the wing broke off. And that released him, dropped down, and got out through the bomb bay just as the ship exploded. He got cut over his eyebrows and uh, singed. Every hair that was outside of his helmet was singed off. Eyebrows and eyelashes were singed, but no other damage whatsoever. 
but uh, his crew to a man went in to see Owen and said they'd never fly with him again. He was so stubborn that he would not give it again to a moving out of that position. He just stayed there. It wasn't our fault. Analysis of the errant pilot's actions. He thought he was in a good position and was going to stay there. He, uh, uh, there's no explanation for it because he, he crossed over under an open bomb bay several times, back and forth. He just slid around us, underneath us. So, uh, like I say, his crew uh, abandoned him and never flew with him again. In fact, he didn't wind up flying anymore either. He was took the ground job after that. Chapter 13, an explanation of the B-24's Davis wing. Well, first of all, uh, David R. Davis was a self-taught uh, engineer that uh, got into aviation. Uh, he built what he called the fluid foil, a wing that uh, had flex in it. Up to that point, every aircraft that was built had fixed wings. B-17 had a very deep draft wing and very long extension on the from front to the rear. <coughs> a great deal of lift. Uh, the, the 24, with this fluid foil, was a smooth uh, wing, but it it flopped. If if plane were standing on the ground, it came up 18 inches, it went down two and a half feet from its position as it sat on the ground. I remember the first time getting into that plane, having flown nothing but fixed wing aircraft, looking out and seeing one engine go up and the other one going down, and I thought, boy, if we can get this thing on the ground before it falls apart, we're going to be lucky. I didn't understand the Davis wing at that point, but I sure got a lesson. It was a marvelous wing. But it had a third less square footage than the B-17 wing. They were approximately the same length, 109, 110 in, uh, inches, feet, if I can say it, uh, across. And, and uh, at any rate, they were very close in length, but they were far from the same in depth. And uh, so the 17 had greater lift. It could fly higher than the 24. 24 was operational up to about 30,000 feet. We, we bombed once from 32,000 feet. We were just hanging there and wallowing on the props. 17 could go to 35,000 feet quite easily. Uh, 24 was faster, carried a heavier bomb load. Chapter 14, the pros and cons of the B-24's Davis wing. Well, Davis wing, as I said, didn't have the same lift. It was a longer uh, run for takeoff. 17 was airborne far before the 24 ever dreamed of even hauling the nose off. Uh, there were many advantages to that wing. One of the things that Davis forgot about was uh, he, he got mad at Rubin, the president of, uh, of Consolidated, who, who bought that wing from him, when he said, you got to hang the wheels someplace, they got to come up into that wing. They had to put foils around the, that. And then also, it, uh, he wanted fuel tanks in the thing, complete from one end to the other. And uh, the first tanks that he put in there didn't have uh, self-sealing. So if a bullet hit it, we had to drain fuel and, or explode on, on uh, impact of the bullet and so forth. So. Uh, when he hung the engines and the wheels on the, it spoiled his foil and uh, it cut back on what it was capable of doing but still in wind tunnel tests that proved to be far more efficient than the 24 than the 17 wing and uh, from a standpoint of efficiency for flight that was that was superior it did not have the lift that the 17 had the Davis wing and battle damage. In battle, in uh, flak, concussion from flak, the wings flapped. The body stayed relatively smooth. It was a smoother bombing, bombing platform, better platform from a gunnery standpoint. It didn't bounce as much because that was taken up in the wings. So 
an advantage certainly there. But, uh, basically, they were two separate planes completely. Mm -hmm. 24 was a lot harder to fly than the 17. 17 was uh, more kite like. Uh, 17 took a lot of beatings, but I can tell you, show you pictures of many 24s that brought people back that they wondered how it ever stayed in the air. So I would say they were very close to par on that. Chapter 15, Mass Manufacturing of the B-24 Liberator. Uh, it was faster to be constructed. Ford Motor Company built them at uh, uh, Willow Run, a brand new plant that Henry Ford built just to build airplanes. And he owned a piece of land. He went out, it was a mile long, and when he got to the end of that mile strip, he was going to keep going, but he didn't own the land. The guy next to him says, no, I'm not building anything on my property to, to, uh, to help this war because he didn't believe in it. So he turned it and made an L-shaped building out of it, staying on his land. A mile and a half long uh, assembly lines, and he had three ships coming down that assembly line at one time. There was a time when one new ship came off the end of that assembly line every 58 minutes. It's impossible to conceive of it. It was for a short period of time, but nonetheless, that's what they were looking for, was something that could be easily manufactured and, and built in mass production. And, and they were able to do that. And uh, that was the first time the concept of having everything fit, regardless of who built it, came into being. Chapter 16, the B-24's flight control systems. Uh, they were subject to, to damage. The uh, hydraulic and electrical lines that went through the 24 were everywhere. And it didn't take a whole lot to do some damage to something, either hydraulics or electric. But uh, um, it was... Uh, well, we used to say, uh, was there any boost to help you handle it? No, Armstrong, that was it. There were no, no assists. The 17 really didn't need it because it was an easier controllable aircraft than the 24. 24, because it bounced a little and so forth, wasn't as uh, apt to be a close, tight, fit like the 17s in formation. The 17 you could fly a smoother formation than you could the 24. You're always rolling a little bit the 24. I still loved it. It was a wonderful aircraft. And, uh, uh, when you think of that great number being built, there's only 11 left in the whole world, only three flyable, and only one outfitted like it was in World War II guns in place, and there were bombs height up front, and, and uh, all the turrets in place. The one at the Smithsonian was the last one on the government uh, uh, inventory. That was flown clear up to 1956, testing de-icing equipment. We did have de-icers on the wings and on the props of the 24. They didn't do that on the 17s, but we did. So it was, uh, from everyone's standpoint, I'd say a marvelous ship to fly. Chapter 17, the joke of B-24 pilots' overdeveloped left arm muscles. Your hand was on the throttles, your left hand did all of the work. And yes, it, it's, it's a standing joke that uh, you can tell them because they can't do anything with the right hand except hold it out there and the left one did all the work, but it's true. It was harder to play, no question about it. As I said, I checked out in the 17 after the war ended over there and we had time. I did uh, check out and got qualified to fly the 17. It was easier, but I still love the 24 very sincerely. So. Chapter 18, Enemy Fighters and Flak. Fighters were a big issue. Flak was the greatest issue, no question about it. And uh, every once in a while, we would see a B-24 flying out way off to the side, not realizing that it was one that the Germans had captured. It 
was up there flying at our altitude, our speed, relaying that to the gunners on the ground, and they could just lay the flag in there like a the almost walk on it. Uh, when you saw that burst and it was red, you could wait a fraction of a second to hear it hit the plane with a hail on the flag. The aluminum on the plane is a sixteenth of an inch thick. It doesn't stop much. Uh, it isn't intended to stop. Chapter 19, The Most Memorable Mission. One flight, if I were to pick up one flight that was the most testy of all of them, I suppose it would be one that I flew on December 26th um, in 1945. Um, to Neuwe, Germany. At, we were about 30 miles from the target. We got hit by two bursts of flat. And we took that right in the cockpit area, right behind the pilot's part on the firewall. Our transfer pumps, where you could, the engineer had to keep transferring fuel from tank to tank from that side to that engine, if necessary, to balance the load for one to see that each engine had uh, an ample supply of fuel. And he was able to do that with a series of pumps. Well, we, we got hit in the one big transfer pump that was pulling fuel from the main tanks. And uh, we lost 1,800 gallons of gas in less than 20 minutes. It poured into the cockpit in a stream of about three inches of bag. Uh, he got an A3 bag trying to stuff it into the hole that was there stopped the flow of fuel, but uh, he got frostbite on his face and 100 octane gas burns in his eyes, but no flame burns, but uh, the fumes just burned and froze his fingers trying to handle it. But uh, at any rate, we lost our ability to keep the engines running. We came back over 60 miles with a full 7,000 pound bomb load aboard. My inclination was to get rid of the bombs, and I said, let's drop the bombs. And I have my armor said, so hell no, don't. I thought, geez, are you trying to contraband an order here, or what's the deal? And then it dawned on me, after I'd said it, I realized I had no, no, no right to say it. Uh, each of those bombs in the bomb rack are secured with hangers, but then there's a spinner on the front of each bomb, and there was a copper wire that was run from that to the stanchion that the bombs were hung from. It's like the old dry cell battery that went through uh, a shaft. And uh, when it let go, it gave off the spark the minute that was pulled. And uh, we couldn't have even gone into the bomb bay with that fuel, fumes in there, and pulled them manually and not have experienced the spark because there was static electricity that builds up in the aircraft. And that was the other reason for that being copper line and so forth. At any rate, had we attempted to do that, I'm not sure one would have blown us completely to pieces. Uh, so we came back 60 miles. I spotted a, a P-51 on a field, air field. And I felt that by now we were back into a country that had been taken over by the U.S. Uh, military, or the 51 wouldn't have been on the ground. And uh, so I, I gave the crew the option of bailing out. I said, I'm sure we're in friendly territory at this point, but I'm going to try and land this thing. And uh, they said, you're staying, we're staying. And uh, we came in for a landing. Uh, of course, we had only one chance. We had one upward engine, the others were gone. We could feather one of them, the other two were windmilling. And uh, uh, when we flared out for the landing, it was the first time we really saw it. But the Germans had occupied that field a couple of nights before, and they set off bombs on either side of the runway, thinking they had destroyed the runway. We landed between those, those uh, mounds of dirt that were lit laying there and rolled out to a complete stop, but I'm leaving something out that's very important. The indicator uh, hollered for gear down and locked. The engineer called, said gear down and locked. Lights came on and he was certain of that. My navigator looked out 
over my left shoulder. He says, the hell it is, the left ear is still up. It fell part ways and, and jammed. And uh, I was able to rock it in on the right wheel and that thing fell down and locked in place and rolled out to a smooth stop. Um, we lost a lot of plate equipment. The ship was there. We abandoned the ship as quickly as we could and got away from it. We slept overnight in the barn. Coldest I've ever been in my life. It snowed that night. The snow was coming through holes in the barn. Uh, next morning we got out there and there was an area about the size of a city block that was just pink with more frost where the gasoline was still dripping out of that airplane. 1,800 gallons of gas. Most of it had run through the bomb bays and came up and burbled up into the waste compartment where there was a hatch. And the waste gunners were walking almost tank deep in gasoline before we landed. So the tail gunner came out of the tail turret because he couldn't stand the fumes. And when the gas went through the ship and out, it vaporized and looked like smoke. And the other ships around us all screamed at us to get out of the formation thinking we were on fire. When they got back, they reported us down and on fire, which wasn't true, we weren't on fire, but they saw this circles of, of, of vaporized gas that looked like a cloud of smoke. So now we got back, we, okay, but, the second day, a uh, six by six army truck pulled in and they were there to uh, see what they could do about dropping munitions and things from the P-51. Didn't even know we were on the field. Saw us and said, well, we'll help you, help you out, we'll get rid of the bombs. So they laid out a cocoa mat. I don't know if you know what I'm speaking of, but it's made of cocoa fronds. It's about, oh, 12, 14 inches thick and it's about, uh, three and a half by three and a half feet square. And years ago, breweries used to sell cake beer to all the uh, bars and things. And they dropped that from the truck bed on those cocoa mats, and roll it to the chute and take it down to the basement. Did this with these thousand pound bombs. Dropped one at a time, out of it out, rolled it up to the side, dropped the next one. and Dropped them all out, seven 1,000 pounders and uh, I saw them taking the nose apart and the detonators were pulled out and they threw those up in the truck and I said, well, you can hop in now, we'll take you to a base where you can get a ride back to your base. I decided to look at what I was sitting on and here's a box of all these detonators, any one of which would have blown it sky high if that thing had gone off. So it was quite, a, quite an experience, probably, as I say, the most memorable individual mission. However, flew 35 missions, we completed a tour of duty. And then after the war ended, we took our ground personnel on a tour of the cities that we had bombed to show them the damage that bombing had done. And I will tell you that we lost more men on those three flights than we did in the last three months of the war. It was just incredible. They told us Give them a good show, fly low and give them a good show. Well, you don't tell a bomber pilot that's been flying like 18, 20, 25,000 feet to fly low. It's uh, not a smart thing to do. We hedge hop. We, we go over Brussels or up to Belgium or any place. We'd be right down on the deck, lift up to go over hedges. And we'd lift up to go over trees, back down again. And we went up uh, the Rhine River and we were right down on the deck. It would be like down around Winona with the bluffs come up on the side. But there were S turns in that right river. And, uh, you think you could rack the plane up and make those turns. They slide. There's no way you had that perception of feel of how much they mush and slide until you've got ground right next to them. And uh, plane after plane would plow into the hillside, kill everybody. Here were these guys who had come over there with the first groups of our, in our squadron, our Wendling, England, that came up through Africa and wound up settling uh, in Wendling, England, all through the war. There'd been crew chiefs and other ground personnel and office help and so forth. These people were there the whole time. I can't imagine what it would be like for the CO to sit down and write to the folks at home and say, person was killed three days after the war ended. It was just uh, unthinkable. 
Chapter 20, A Close Call, and the End of the Trolley Mission. There again, crazy things happen. We followed the ship. Everything he did, I did. Where he started to slide, I'd get a chance to pull up a little bit quicker, get over the top of the hill. Uh, we came along the river, and there was a bridge, large, not a suspension bridge, but uh, an arch bridge. And he didn't see it at the time. He pulled up and hit me. We were right behind him. And I could see if I pulled up, I'd be doing the same thing. So I dropped the nose and went under the bridge with the debris of his plane falling around us. Something I'll never forget. But at the end of that flight, I came back and said, no more. There's just no way I can do it. And that's when we ended the trolley mission. So we didn't take another person up after that. It was uh, unthinkable, truly. Chapter 21, the bombing of Switzerland. We happened to bomb Switzerland twice. A neutral country. One day, we were led by a general. A general led the entire flight. And uh, we got broken up in cloud cover. Uh, we were told to pick targets of opportunity because the tar primary target had been obscured by, by uh, clouds. And we saw him with three of his ships inside of us, there were four. We and another ship joined, so there, was, there were the six of us. And uh, he, uh, he headed towards Switzerland. Our navigator came on in, in the ship and said, uh, we're headed right for Switzerland. So we broke radio silence and said, check your position. He came back and said, follow me. As we crossed the border, our navigator said again, we're over Switzerland. We did the same thing, check your position, follow me. And uh, pretty quick he ordered Bombay doors open, opened our Bombay doors. We toggled out our bombs and flew out of there. We had bombed a ball bearing factory, building a ball bearing in Germany. He knew exactly what he was doing. However, we bombed a neutral country and we paid reparations, some $50 million to Switzerland as we bombed a part of Switzerland. All he said it was an accident. Things didn't know where they were, the cloud cover and so forth. Yeah, well, he knew exactly where he was going, no question about it. Speculation on why the Swiss were manufacturing war materials for Germany. It's war again, and, and uh, they were out to make money on it. And, uh, yeah, it was as much their fault as ours, but uh, it, another one that I can recall very distinctly is uh, our ship was laid aside for about three days to be ret retrofitted to carry a new something tell us what. And finally, they, uh, they told us that all we would need would be five personnel aboard the ship. Pilot, co-pilot, engineer, radio operator, navigator. And uh, all the enlisted crew as gunners would be stood down for this flight. When we got to the ship, we saw that they had loaded uh, the forward compartment. There's two bomb bays in the 24, the forward one being the largest. They put uh, the overseas uh, May West tanks is what they call them. Big rubber tanks in the forward compartments. And in the rear bomb bay, they hung six paper mache uh, P-51 wingtip tanks that they used for extra fuel. And they hung those as bombs in the back portion of them, filled with napalm. The whole, the whole thing, the two rubber tanks and the six paper mache tanks were filled with napalm. Uh, the plane ahead of us crashed on takeoff. We went right through the flames of that. I would never forget that sight as long as I lived. The plane tipped to the side. We saw the guys just pawing, trying to get out. Of course, nobody survived. Chapter 22, the Napalm Bombing Mission in France. And we dropped our, our uh, Napalm at 18,000 feet. And uh, we, uh, it was an atrocity. Definitely an atrocity in the war. Uh, 
There were 50,000 Germans who had been back to the coast of Rouen, France. And uh, they were cut off from their supply lines. They were also cut off from food supplies. They got nothing in the way of Arnold or anything else, just what, what they were forced back with. And uh, uh, at the, at, uh, they had been raiding farms and things around the area, killing cattle and chickens and stealing food, desperate for food. And the French put up with it for a time, but then finally said, we've got to do something about it. And uh, we, we, uh, we need a strike of some kind. So they conjured up this napalm. There were less than 10,000 survivors out of 50,000 people. So it was truly an atrocity. But uh, you won't find this recorded. I'm telling you the gospel truth. I have other. Uh, you'll, you'll hear it periodically. There's two or three of us who are on that mission and have talked openly about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it at this point. Uh, I, I think it was the, the wise thing to do. War is hell, no matter where it is or what it is. And if somebody is uh, uh, stranded like that, desperate, they're going to do all kinds of things that aren't comfortable to see or be near. And uh, they had to be treated, treated in some fashion. It was easier to do it from the air with napalm than any other method, so that was it. The reasoning for the use of napalm on this mission. Well, it was, it, it's a gasoline uh, with sticky material. Anything that sticks to it, it ignites when it hits air. You don't need to trigger it at all. It's a hellish thing hits you, you're going to burn. That's all there is to it. It builds with uh, almost phosphorus-like uh, intensity. So uh, I, I don't know whose judgment it was to do that. Uh, but uh, I would say it was the most effective thing. If you were going to try and bomb that many people in this area, uh, it almost needed a nuclear bomb, which we didn't even know about. Chapter 23, First Encounter with a Jet. I gotta tell you one, one incident, of course, is I was flying a mission one day when I saw this plane coming toward us. Went through our formation so fast that we couldn't comprehend what, what it was. First jet, it's, we did not know what a jet was. Nobody, intelligence, no one had ever mentioned jets. Didn't know that the United States knew anything about them. We were building them at the time, but the first jet that came through was the German jet, 109. And I can remember this guy coming and tipping up to go through between two ships. And I saw his face, just like I'm seeing your face right now, and not much farther away than you are. His eyes were just like saucers, and his mouth was a gape. He was. Nobody could comprehend the, the rate of closure. He never opened fire. He couldn't. It was, it was, his concern was, how am I going to get through this without striking an airplane? He wasn't ready to do a kamikaze type thing and hit us. He wanted to get through it. Uh, I remember that. It, it just like I could, I could see the guy. Another time, a German uh, parachuted out of his plane one of our gunners hit a fighter and he parachuted and came down through our formation. And again, uh, very close by. I remember the black boots that were on his legs. And, and uh, now of course, he was hanging in the parachute. And the Germans very often shot our people that were in the parachutes. I was pleased that none of our people shot him. I, I really, that would have been a terrible thing. I mean, that would have opened it for anybody to do whatever they wanted to for a captured individual. We had done that. Chapter 24, German fighters ramming bombers. Yeah, and that was out of desperation. They had no fuel left to fly. When they did fly, they, they weren't with you very long because they didn't have the range that we had by adding tanks. They didn't have the fuel to put in them and so forth. And the only way they were going to take anybody down was to ram it. And there were incidents like that. I wasn't involved in anything like that. I saw planes that were hit. 
some of them, uh, one of them, like that plane that Wes speaks about, uh, that was blown apart, but I saw somewhere a wing of a plane had gone through and just severed the spine of the, of the plane. And uh, it was just some of the uh, 24 came back actually hanging on just by cables that were running and that, that didn't get cut. They, they snapped the spine of the plane, but the cables held it together. So, uh, yeah, it was, you know, I. There, I, I don't know, there's so many stories, so many, each, each mission it was a story in itself, there's no question about it. We had milk runs, the easy ones, where we didn't see a fighter, didn't see black. They were uh, few and far between. But we hit uh, sub pans, we hit bridges. Our main targets were marshalling yards where they assembled trains to move supplies and personnel and we knock out tracks as much as possible. It wasn't until we went after the petroleum bases that we really hurt the Germans. The others got back into place before too long, laid tracks over holes, filled the holes, laid new tracks, trains were running again. And then when the fighters were allowed to go down instead of staying up there with the bombers the whole time, they had a buildup of enough P-51s, P-38s, and P-47s to actually let a portion of them, a third of them at least, go down and hit targets. So they would strafe trains and blow up uh, ammunition along the tracks and blow up the steam engine or move after troops that were marching or moving forward with tanks and other things they were being hit from the fighter. You know, our, our bombing at the time had to be, was called strategic bombing. We did look for targets. We weren't out to hit population areas. A lot of bombs fell there because it was just massive numbers and so forth, but it wasn't intentional. The idea was we were picking factories, and marshaling yards, and bridges, and tunnels, and sub pens, and a specific target each time. I saw that uh, in our formation plane as we were climbing to altitude. We had a zone that we had to stay within. Sometimes it was one of our own ships that ran into another. There were times when, honestly, I, there's one particular one I'll, I'll explain right now. Uh, there was a time in, in, uh, when we were at our target, we hit 10 tenths cloud cover. And we were in this, this cloud formation and you couldn't see your wing tip. You didn't see the ship next to you at all. Now, I was flying in that position I told you about, adjacent to the head ship. I knew he would drop down onto the instruments. He was looking at uh, staying at the same altitude, same heading, and same speed. And I figured, okay, I'm gonna do the same thing. Stay right here where we're at. The others all scattered. We came out at the end of that cloud, came into clear air, fighters sitting up above, they came down and came up down. Virtually every one of those ships, the only ships that got back, we were the only ones that got back to our base. The lead ship got back to a place in Belgium where he landed and got back eventually. The others were all shot down. That was, that was on my first mission. Uh, this was a case of, uh, in that barracks that I told you about where officers from Fort Bruce were 16 of us in there. We came back that day and cleaned out the, the contents of their lockers and so forth. Got their uh, stuff all packed, ready to send out because they were gone. And, uh, and we survived. So. But there was a case where uh, We could have had collisions in the air. We didn't. There were times, though, when we were forming, where you're certain, and you're trying to climb to the altitude, and eventually you'll take off and head toward Holland, or Belgium, on into Germany. And there we had mid-air collisions. And yes, I saw a couple of those. And 
then the other one, of course, that I'll never forget is that tape up with that name on it. That was a horrible sight. Unbelievable. Because as we came over them, you take off at about three second intervals. And uh, there wasn't any any way that we could have avoided flying right through that, right through the flames that were coming up. And to see those guys clawing, trying to get out, and uh, of course they lasted seconds more and they were, they were done. Uh, those are, they're not nightmares to me, what they're wearing and they do. I, I get a little broken up when I speak about them. And, uh, I'll never be in otherwise, I'm sure. Because not necessarily close friends, we had a lot of close friends that, uh, that we, we missed. Guys that I uh, had as, as a check ride, they, they checked me out to go from co-pilot to pilot status. And uh, two, three missions later, they were gone. It didn't make you wonder. Those guys had been there for quite some time. Survival based on faith and prayer. A lot of faith in the Lord. I did a lot of praying. And I've said several times, there had to be somebody else beside us in the cockpit. Um, I don't know how else to put it. Because there's, uh, there's things we came through that uh, it wasn't by anything we did something the good Lord was looking out for us on, as far as I'm concerned. I can't say it any other way. I, I really mean that. Uh, it, it made Christians out of a lot of people. And, uh, I, uh, like I say, I didn't drink or smoke. I didn't carouse a lot. I wasn't uh, adverse to going with and having fun, but uh, I never used alcohol or tobacco to degree and well never used it period I used it to uh, to help me <laughs> with uh, like I say giving it to the kids having laundry and so forth done it's unique after the war Larry married Louise Woodhouse on March 6th 1946 at Richfield Lutheran Church in Minneapolis Minnesota they have two sons Lee born in 1949 and Dale in 1950. Larry remained active in the Air Force Reserve through 1954, flying AT-6s out of the Wolf Chamberlain Field in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He returned to the family floral and nursery business, Bachman Incorporated, as a third generation owner. He retired from the business as corporate secretary and manager in charge of the nursery and landscape division. The fifth Bachman generation continues to carry on the family business, celebrating their 120th anniversary in 2005. Larry has been active in many nonprofit and benevolent associations as both a board member and as an active volunteer. These groups include the 8th Air Force Historical Society Minnesota Chapter, the Shriners Hospital for Children, the Minnesota Masonic Home, and the Salvation Army. Larry is active in the Richfield Lutheran Church and has five grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. He has worked and served as an important asset to our community and to our country.